Wikipedia said that there are four basic defenses that employers can use for actually having what we might be perceived as a discriminatory selection practice based on race, sex, religion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the first one is this issue of job relatedness. And I've already implied this when I was talking about the high school diploma versus um, you know, not having the high school diploma or the situation um, where a firefighter, you know, the standards to, to, to hit firefighting is pretty high and if people don't meet those standards, they can't get the job. Now, um, what happens, right? You know, you have the call for adverse impact and then they, they validate the selection system and say, here are the tools that we're using and here's, the, here's where we may see some problems. And so, this came up with firefighters in some major cities where they, the standards were set really high and they said, hey, you know, you need to meet these standards. And someone said, well, let's validate them. And they realized that they were probably set a little too high. So they adjusted the standards to be more reasonable and not, not reasonable in such that they said, oh, well, you know, you can only lift five pounds. That's fine. You can be a firefighter. Well, clearly that's not going to work. But they made a legitimate adjustment to, to really what is more practical, more reasonable, one would expect. And the selection system still had less women and minorities. It had more than before, but it still had less than um, uh, one would expect. And so you do the statistical analysis, you investigate the, the selection system. The selection system is, is legitimate. It's based on legitimate reasons and le legitimate expectations to be able to do the job. It is what we call a job-related selection system. And if the selection system is job related, even if it still has an unintended impact, you can keep that selection system. So it, 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 if you can't pass the firefighters test, if you're a woman, too bad. You know, the bottom line is you have to meet certain standards and if your body can't do it, um, uh, you know, then, you know, you have to be able to, um, you, know, you know, address that. So that's the first thing. The job relatedness is about the relationship with adverse impact. Is it having an adverse impact? Well, it, it might be, but um, it doesn't mean that it's still illegal discrimination. So um, it has the adverse impact, but it's legitimate because the selection system is job related and there's no way of getting around it. Then there's nothing we can do if people can't meet that standard. In terms of business necessity, um, um, Business necessity means we need to have this particular criteria to have a um, uh, safe functioning, safe and efficient running of our business. Um, and so we do this because it keeps us safe. So, you know, drug tests, total business necessity, right? We need to make sure that we are conducting business in such a way that people um, are not having drug tests. So drug tests might have an adverse impact against some groups. The bottom line is we have to demonstrate that that drug test, if we don't do the drug test, this is going to have an adverse impact on our ability to do a particular job, right? So that's how we get around this. What are some things that don't fall within business necessity? You can't say my company will only work with white people. You know, my, you know, my customers only like white people or my customers don't like women or my customers don't like this. So customer preference is not a... Um, a legitimate defense under business necessity. Um, you know, and you might say, well, how do we deal with that when we're dealing with places like Saudi Arabia where women don't work, or Japan where for a long time women executives were not respected in the same way that, that male executives were. It's very different when you're working in a global community than you are within the United States. Obviously, when we're working in a global community, standards are very different, right? So the expectations are going to be very different. And we have to keep that in mind. But within the boundaries of the U.S., we can't turn around and say, well, my clients won't talk to people who are Jewish. My clients won't talk to women. My clients won't talk to African Americans. It's not legitimate. You then get new clients. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just not going to, they're either going to have to learn to deal with it or move on. So business necessity is, is, tool, is, is, is an argument that companies make to say, you know, we need to do this. We need this selection tool because it helps us to be able to do you know, to, to, to safely operate our business so we can treat people differently because of that. Um, and that's, again, relates to the adverse impact issue. Next thing um, is the bona fide occupational qualification, or what we call a BFOQ. And the bona fide occupational qualification says, it's all right for me to say, I won't hire you because you're a woman to do a particular job. And, and there's rare circumstances where it occurs, 
but it has been upheld and it does occur. One example is um, within the, um, the, um, uh, the prison system. Um, it's legitimate. It's a legitimate reason to say I'm not going to hire female prison guards to work in a male maximum security prison because again there is a differential physical ability between um, men and women. Men have a lot more strength and if you imagine men in a maximum security prison who pretty much have nothing to do but work out and, and beat each other up and you know all the, the, the horror stories that we hear that happens in, in, in prisons you know, women are at a risk for being beat up and being sexually abused by prisoners. And, you know, and, and you can understand that. So, again, the, the, the care has to be taken to recognize, you know, yeah, it would be great to have women in this job, but we really know that there is a, um, there's a differential impact. And in, in, in rare circumstances, the courts will find that it's okay to say, you know, I'm not going to let you do this job because there's just no way I, we can keep you safe. Now, there are other circumstances where, you, you know, you can say, well, you know, um, and, and a great example of this is Johnson Controls. You know, they're in their um, certain parts of their business deal with very caustic chemicals. And the company initially decided, well, we won't let women you know, work in this job because they are more likely to be affected by this and they may not be able to get pregnant. May not. That's not a guarantee, but they may not be able to get pregnant or have birth defects in the future. So we won't let women do those jobs. Well, they were really high paying jobs. Men were allowed to do them. And, but yet men were also affected by it, but women were not allowed to. And, and the company wasn't thinking about it from the, from the perspective of, well, I want to treat women differently. We want to, um, you know, not let women have these opportunities. It was more from a safety perspective. And in, and in that circumstance, um, just because someone might be able to bear children or might have the capability of bearing them and they might not want them doesn't mean that they should be precluded from doing the job. So this is a, a slightly different circumstance in that there isn't always a possibility that someone will be affected by those chemicals and, um, and not be able to get pregnant or have birth defects. It's a possibility, but it's not a probability. Whereas a woman working in a male's prison the probability of getting hurt is fairly high, almost guaranteed, to the point where they could be raped or, or killed, you know, in that circumstance. So it's a slightly different uh, circumstance. The factors involved in that decision are slightly different. And so Johnson Controls had to allow women to do the job as long as they were aware that they were at risk and that they were aware that if they didn't follow safety procedures, they would increase the likelihood of the risk of getting um, exposed to the chemicals and having those problems. And so given that, um, you know, that's a very different circumstance because now women could understand that if I do this, it's, I mean, they won't lose their life, but they might not be able to bear children. Or it's possible that women had their children and they didn't want anymore and it didn't matter to them. So they wanted the opportunity to do those jobs as well. <clears throat> so in those circumstances, the company had to uh, allow women to do that. They couldn't say, um, you can't do this job because you're a woman. Um, where are some other circumstances? Well, I mean, I know as, as, as silly as it sounds, we can't sue the Catholic Church if you're a woman to become a priest, right, or, or the Pope. You, know, you can't say, well, you know, I'm a woman and I'm qualified and I should go do it because religious organizations get to set the rules for, for who should be clergy and who shouldn't be clergy. Um, you know, so they can set those, those expectations. So um, there are rare circumstances where we can say there's a bona fide occupational qualification, typically around gender or religion, um, very rarely, if ever, and I think probably not at all, really around issues of race or color or ethnicity, um, but certainly around um, uh, sex and religion, there are circumstances when we can argue we really only can hire someone who is this faith tradition or is a woman or is a man to do these particular jobs because it fits. The last one is uh, a bona fide seniority system. In the bona fide seniority system, um, the circumstance is we have to have a legitimate system that says this person has seniority and this person has less seniority. It has to be understood when an employee walks in, they know where they rank in that seniority system, how far they high up or how low they are. And 
clearly there has to be a merit system based on someone's seniority. So the more senior person gets the job opportunity, the less senior person is the first likely first person to be laid off. Now, when does this come into play? We see it most likely when we have um, uh, a situation where an organization may be doing um, affirmative action hiring, where they realize that they are underrepresented in women and minorities, and so they're doing more active diversity hiring in order to get the numbers, the proportions up. But then they have to do a layoff system. And if the company has a bona fide seniority system, the bona fide seniority system trumps the affirmative action. Right? It, it trumps it. So even though I want my company to be more diverse and I've been actively hiring more women and minorities to be more diverse, I have to follow the seniority system. And the seniority system says, last in, first out, the LIFO method, right? It's the last hired, first fired. So if my diverse hires are my most recent hires and they have the least seniority, it doesn't matter if there is an affirmative action intention or com com being compelled to do this. If we have a bona fide seniority system, the seniority system trumps any affirmative action efforts that the company's doing. So, you know, your white, um, if your 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 majority group, your more senior people are white, they're going to keep their jobs, and there's n there's no there's no argument around this. This is not a form of discrimination. It's because you are basing it on this bona fide seniority system that says the more senior person gets the job, the least senior person is out first. And so it's really important when you go to a company to be clear whether or not there is a bona fide seniority system. If, the, if there is a ranking that people hold and that there are rewards that are related to a seniority system. Where do we typically see seniority systems? In unionized government. Uni unionized jobs, government jobs, public service jobs like firefighters and police officers and things like that. All of these things base all of their promotional opportunities and job opportunities on a seniority system. So that bona fide seniority system trumps, trumps affirmative action every time no matter how hard you want it to be diverse. If the, if, the, if the seniority system is in place, the seniority system works. That's the one that, that, holds, that holds true. Title VII has been amended a number of times. I mean, so we're really clear about what is adverse impact, what is disparate treatment, um, but there are all sorts of amendments that have had to occur, because as I said, the law changes all the time, interpretations of the, lay, the laws change all the time, so um, amendments have to occur in order to get some clarity on, on really what these laws mean. So in 1978, Title VII was amended, for example, regarding pregnancy discrimination, because pregnancy became a form of sex discrimination. Pregnant women have a temporary disability, should be treated like any other temporary disability. Someone has a heart attack, someone trips and falls and hurts themselves and can't work, um, they injure their back, what have you. Um, no one goes on, you know, medical leave and then comes back and suddenly is told, well, you don't have your job, you can't do your job, or you're fired because of that. You're not supposed to. And so pregnancy needs to be treated like any other short-term disability, and that's part of that. So we didn't want to have women discriminated against because of the fact that they could get pregnant. Second, the Civil Rights Act of 1991 tried to adjust some of the challenges that occurred as case law evolved and really shifted away from the original intent of what the Civil Rights Act was trying to do. Originally, the law said the onus is on the employer to prove that they didn't discriminate, but court interpretations over time shifted so that the burden of proof started to fall back on the employee to prove that they were discriminated against. And, and again, imagine, right? It's like, I don't know what your intentions are. All I can tell you is what I can see you know, as the plaintiff, that these are the facts and this is the circumstances and these this circumstances look like you could have discriminated against me because of that. I don't know what your intention is. I don't know what your decision-making um, reasoning was. You need to prove that your reasoning was not illegal, that you were not illegally deciding to remove me from the pool because of my race, sex, religion, disability, you name it. So the Civil Rights Act of 91 said, okay, the onus has to be on the employer to prove that they did not illegally discriminate. Okay, so originally it had shifted away, but, the, but Congress said, no, our intention is that the burden of proof falls on the employer, period. So all these interpretations of it are incorrect. Our intention is based on um, the employer having to do the 
to, to prove that they didn't discriminate. Other things that the Civil Rights Act of 91 brought about was um, the right to have a jury trial, whereas that was not the case before 1991. And, and again, go back to constitutional law. We have the right to a jury trial. So if you're violating the law in civil rights law, why isn't there a jury trial? So now it said, yes, you can have a jury trial. It's not just a judge hearing your case. It also allowed for compensatory and punitive damages. Again, you know, when a company continually and, and repeatedly discriminates against people illegally, then there's only so many times you can punish them when you really have to hit them hard where their pocketbook is because that's what's going to get their attention. So the compensatory or punitive damages is the way to go on that. Lastly, um, the issue of quotas. Um, it had started to become this issue where we could have a quota. People were thinking of um, em employment law as well. We have to have a quota of blacks and a quota of whites and a quota of women and a quota of whatever group we wanted. And um, the interpretation is no, there is no quotas. You can even do race-based uh, norming. You can say, well, I'm compared to other African Americans and you are compared to other whites and, and, and I will hire based on you know, these race-based normings. Race-based norming and quotas are illegal under the Civil Rights Act. The goal is, with affirmative action, is we attract qualified women and minorities and we attract all people into our, into our applicant pool and then we hire based on quality. We hire based on who's the best candidate. That's how it is supposed to legally and appropriately work. People don't always do that, but that is the law and how it's supposed to be interpreted.